If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we ask that you turn uh, to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter number 12, and we're going to begin reading in the very first verse. The Gospel of Luke chapter 12, in the very first verse, the Bible says, In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trolled one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in light, and that which ye have spoken in the ear and closet shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that can, they can do that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear, Fear him that which he which hath which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I, I say unto you, fear him. For are, for are not five sparrows sold for two farthings, and not one of them is forgotten before God? But even the very hairs of your head are numbered. Fear not, therefore. Ye are, worth, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for all that you do. We pray this morning that you would open your word to our hearts, Lord, that we might uh, gain from it as always, Lord, that we might be encouraged uh, in all that, uh, how strong and mighty and how steady you are. God, help us together as a people that we might have a desire to serve you and to share the gospel with those that, that we run into, Lord, and that we might tell them of your saving grace. God bless your word to the hearts of the hearers, and we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, some fairly familiar verses of Scripture, and we'll be preaching this morning on God Knows. Uh, and we sometimes, uh, we, uh, we project that God is omniscient, which means he's all-knowing, and then we behave in a different way, like he needs some help, or he needs informing, or he needs to be told about something, which is never true. Now, I think if we carefully watch the scripture, many times it's taken out of context. And the message, uh, especially for whom the message is, not necessarily what the message says, but whom the Lord is addressing. In the very first verse, again, the Bible says, in the meantime. And any time when you see that, you need to go back and pick up what has just occurred so you'll know what the connection is. That what had just happened in the end of verse 11, or in the end of chapter 11, excuse me, is that he had rebuked the Pharisees and put them in their place if you, uh, and, and uh, show them exactly um, what hypocrisy they had. He had dealt with the ones that were um, uh, obstinate against God, and now he puts that aside. In the meantime, when they were together together, an innumerable multitude of people. Now, the whole span there, uh, the Bible says was un innumerable and that they were a people. Now, if you remember about the time in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah that the nation of Israel had become a mixed multitude. You remember that. And what they had to do in their direction from God was to set the, the people that were not fully Jew is to set them aside and leave them behind. And it was a great grief, I mean, a great grief to those people because they were part, they had been part of their families. Now, very similarly here, you know who hears the word of God this morning? The very 
form that the God Almighty of heaven reveals the word to. Now, we have a, a handful of people here this morning, and you know what? I'll, I'll dare say to you, some will go out of here saying, what was he talking about? And the only thing I can say to that is he didn't open your heart. And, and so we find that even in this day, so the Pharisees and the Sadducees had already been set aside in Luke 11, and now they have this innumerable host of people and not all of them heard either. Out of all these people, there were only certain ones that got the message. In the meantime, there were, there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they drove one upon another. And he began to say unto his disciples... So we've had the Pharisees and Sadducees set aside. We've had the multitude to set aside. And now we find that this message is just for his disciples. Now, who are the disciples of the Lord? And that are the, those are those that are saved. Those are his disciples, their followers. Campbellite people like to call themselves the disciples of Christ. They are not the disciples of Christ, but what they're trying to convey in that is that they are the followers, the listeners of Christ. So when this, uh, this message was going out to a huge crowd, it really was just for a few people. And, and so he says, uh, and he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, in other words, they were the priority. You know what the priority is today of uh, the Lord is his people. That's still his priority. That's still who he is concerned with. So to those people, he says, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. So to his disciples, he warns about a group that's very well known, and that is the Pharisees, the, the temple uh, mounties, the temple strong people. He says, beware of what they have to say. Beware of what they are doing. And he says, because what they're doing is hypocrisy. Now, hypocrisy is this. You say one thing, and you do another. You say, you need to do this very carefully, and you make a sloppy job yourself. That is being a hypocrite. That is being uh, giving advice that you don't even take uh, yourself. And that's what the leaven of the Pharisees was. So the leaven uh, is a doctrine that's still out there today, and it puffs you up. The leaven of the Pharise uh, Pharisees is this. It's a works-based salvation. And it still puffs us up today as much as it puffed us up back then. And that is the leavening of the Pharisees. Why do we use unleavened bread in the Lord's Supper? You ever, you ever thought about why that, why that is? It's not puffed up. It's flat and plain. It is what it is. And that's exactly where we ought to desire to be as the Lord's people is to be like the bread that we use in the Lord's table and be just a plain, uh, we are what we are kind of people and not be puffed up. Uh, so again, still talking to his disciples, not, not to anybody else, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed. Now, I've heard this preached a lot, and, and sometimes this is where I think maybe it's out of context. Oh, but you see, you, know, you can't sin without it ever being found out. Um, I think it's more, you can't, you can't honor God that it won't be revealed in the last day. Remember crowns, and you remember the ten pieces of uh, the the ten talents. 
That is when it will be revealed. In the last days, whatever you work, your works, whatever you've done, and, and whatever you haven't done, it will be revealed in the last days because, again, he's addressing disciples. He's not addressing non-believers. He's not addressing the lost. He's addressing the redeemed, his followers, his disciples. For there is nothing covered. Now, right now, we need to cover our works the best we can. We don't know, go, need to go around shouting about it and say, hey, look at me. Guess what I've done? Guess what? You know what? Uh, this is what happened at church Wednesday night. No, we need to keep them covered. If you're able to help somebody out in the crisis that we're now enduring, keep your mouth shut. Help them and keep your mouth shut. Uh, and it, it will be revealed at a later time. It will be revealed on down the road. Uh, but right now, keep it to yourself. Keep it covered. And the Lord uh, will be pleased for that. For there's nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Wherefore soever, uh, therefore whatsoever you have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light. Now, uh, what have you spoken in darkness? What have you said in darkness? Now, the darkness may be your home. Uh, there's things that me and Don talk about that we don't talk about to anybody else. That's a, a time of darkness. You know, what does the Bible concern, uh, say concerning prayer? Go unto thy closet, and when thou shut the door, there begin to pray. Now, we, we have, uh, I guess, five, four or five closets in our house, and mine and Donna's and uh, Joey and uh, Sarah's, they have lights on them. You can turn a light on and see all around them, but Bella's closet doesn't have a light. It's dark in there, and when you get in there and get in the closet, if you pull the door shut, it's going to be dark. But whatever you say behind that door and whatever you do behind the door is between you and the Lord. That's a place of darkness. And so one day, you know what? If you have a lousy prayer life, one day it's going to be known. If you don't meet with God occasionally in and of yourself, one day it's going to be a very, very real thing to you. So I, I ask you this morning, what's revealed? What, 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 what are you getting uh, from this? What are you... Uh, what are you doing behind the scenes? Verse 3. The, uh, uh, Therefore whatsoever you have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which you have spoken in the ear and closet shall be proclaimed upon the housetop. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them which kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do, but I will forewarn you, whom shall you fear? Fear him which have, the, have after he hath killed, have power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Now, we've been talking a lot about fear lately with coronavirus and everything that's going on. And you know what? What we really need to ask is what do you fear? You know what I have seen with fear? It'll make you do decisions that you ordinarily wouldn't do. Sure. It will make you hide. It'll make you, uh, it will make you run. It'll make you uh, do things in a very different way than you ordinarily do. That's what fear will do. Yeah. And, and so we see then... Uh, the Lord, I mean, uh, the, the Lord here in this text, he doesn't say not to fear. He says, where are you going to place your fears? Because, you know, whatever you fear, your behavior is the result. And he says, listen, you fear me. You fear the Lord. Don't you worry about anybody else, but you fear me. Now, see, we live in a day and age today where God is so presented, and even the Lord Jesus Christ, that they wouldn't swat a fly or anything else. But what the Bible says is you 
fear him. Why do you fear him? He tells you. Because I'll cast you into a lake of fire. Uh, I'll do away with you. I'll put you in the, the very minimum of hell. That's what I will do to you. And because he has the authority and the, and the ability to do that, our fears rather should be placed in him. And, and so, again, he's addressing his own people. Verse 6. Are not, are not five sp sparrows sold for two farthings? Now, a lot of people leave this out too. What were they for? What would you buy at buy sparrows? Well, we wouldn't because we're not Jewish. But Jews would. And they were for the sacrifice. And he's saying, what are you going to sacrifice? How, how, how worthy are you? Uh, well, how much time do you have to spend? How much money do you have to invest? What are you going to do with the ministry that God has given to you? Are not five sparrows sold for two fatherings, and not one of them is forgotten before God? Now, why? And I've heard that so misquoted. But why are they not forgotten? Because they were sacrificed. Mm -hmm. Has nothing to do. You know, I know God knows everything, but if a bird was just flying out there and, and suddenly died and fell to the ground, certainly he would understand that, but that's not what he's talking about here. In context, he's talking, I know about your private sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Not what you're going, woo, look at me, look at what we're doing, woo, but your private practice sacrifice. I know what it's all about. I know exactly what you're doing, and I know, more importantly, what you're not doing. And, and many, many times, that's exactly where we are, is the not doing as opposed to the doing. And, and so we see, he says, I know this. Verse 7, but even the very hairs of your head are numbered. Now, Adam's had to do a little tricky thing in my hair. I thought this only happened to... Uh, uh, certain other people, but my hairline is coming forward and forward and forward. So he uh, he he creates me a hairline, you know, and that's stressing. I'm like, okay, is my eyebrows going to meet my hair one day? And it's kind of a little stressful for me. But you know what? God's got that. He knows all about it, and that's the way He wants me to look. I guess the only thing I do is accept it. Hmm. You see what I'm saying? He knows that about you. You are not second class to anything. You are not an afterthought. He knows all about you. You know what? Whatever, and, and, and your men, your men, I remember again, he's saying, you may be sacrificed. That, that's what he's talking about. He just told them, they might kill you, don't stress, I know about it, I know all things, and fear me, don't fear them that can kill you, fear me. And so he gets back to this, he says, I know about it already. You know what, I don't know how many people are going to die with corona, but God does. And every person that ever got it, was meant to have it. That's all you can come to, right? And you know what? I don't know what's going on with my heart. I've been good. I don't know, maybe I had a reaction to church this morning, but I was, I was sitting there uh, listening to Brother Junior's good Sunday school class and started getting short of breath. My chest was hurting a little bit. But you know what? God knows all about that. It doesn't take him by surprise because he knows it and he planned it. So as well as my hair doing the weird things it's doing these days, you know what? If this is a problem in here, he knows exactly where the blockage is. If it's my lungs, you know, if they're drying up, he's dried them up himself. What have I to fear? Nothing. You know all this going around and buying toilet paper and all the foolishness. You know, you know why they're doing that? They say, oh, well, it's going to be a ration on it. 
No, they're afraid. They're afraid. Right? They won't say that, but that is the real thing. And, and so we find then, as the Lord's people, many, many times what we're doing is working and reacting under fear. But, every, but even the very hairs of your head are numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. So again, going back to the sacrifice, if you sacrifice your life, if you sacrifice your home, if you uh, sacrifice your automobile, listen, he's got it. He knows all about it, even before that you did it. Now, we're going to look at a few people that had this mindset and, and reacted on this mindset and lived exactly what this scripture is teaching to God's people. Way back in 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 4, uh, in verse 8. 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse 8, the Bible says this, and it fell on the day that Elisha passed to Shuman, where was a great woman. Now, she was rich. I, that's what that means. She's a wealthy woman. She was a great woman and constrained him to eat bread. Now, a lot of young people, me and Donna's talking about outdoor toilets on the way into church this morning, and how my children and my grandchildren really don't even know what they're about. You know, uh, uh, me and Don saying, well, the last generation that really had to use them was ours. And that was just when we were young. And that that was falling out of vogue. And the very thing that this scripture is is based on the same thing. And I've said this many times. If, uh, if a bomb came up to the house when I was growing up, my grandma would feed them. Now, she would, uh, she would scrape whatever she had together, and she made them sit on the porch but she always fed them. And, and similarly based on this, we find Elisha, a homeless preacher that had nowhere else to go. He shows up at the Shumanite woman's house, and it fell on the day that Elisha passed to Shuman, and there was a great woman, a rich woman, a wealthy woman, and she constrained or required him to eat bread. Now, I find that a little strange. I, I'm very glad for the Shumanite woman and the work she's fixing to do. But ladies, if I came over to your house, would you give me some crackers? Would you give me a piece of bread? You know, the Shumanite woman had more to do with, I would have to say I know she did it, because she was rich. Now, that bread even lasts today, don't it? That bread is still a story that's very well known and preached about and told about. But what a wonderful thing is she made a big spread with it, with, with, with beef and, and bread and beans and potatoes and all that laid before him. What a different story it would be. But even that bread, even the slightest thing that she did, is still recorded as a memorial for her today. And, and so we find then sometimes the smallest of things, and again, a lot of people don't look at like at that, but also, well, maybe, maybe she could have done a little bit more. She was rich, she was wealthy. And that's still told about her too, is it not? Kind of humbling thing to me. And so it was that as oft as he passed by, he turned thither to eat bread. So he got in this habit that every time that he went that way, she knew again that he had bread, that she had bread. It didn't say that he ever she ever offered him anything else ever gave him, but that bread even today still stands as a testimony, and the best we know, she never told anybody. Who, you know, this is just a recording of the Bible. She didn't run around and say, hey. I fixed that preacher some more bread today. Uh, I want to let y'all know that he was over at the house and, and, you know, you ever thought, well, maybe she was ashamed to say that's all she'd done. <laughs> now, uh, Jews couldn't eat bacon, but she didn't fix him bacon and biscuits and gravy. 
bread. <clears throat> now, again, that's a good thing. She did that much, but stands as testimony to her even today. And, and so we find then, as the Lord's people, maybe we should give it all we have to the Lord Jesus Christ, and later on down the road, he will let others know about it. Verse 9 uh, she has a change of heart. And she said unto her husband, Behold now, I perceive that this is a holy man of God. So maybe when he first started running by, she thought he was a bum. Man, that fellow don't even work. All he does is preach, 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 preach. But after getting to know him, and we have to assume several trips by by her house now, because it said off he would come that way. She got to learning. Why do you do this for? Why don't you buy a house and get you a job? Why don't you quit walking around all the time? Why don't you let Gehazi get a job? And so he began to tell her what his mission was and why he was doing it. And after a long time, she says to her old man, hey, I believe this man is the real deal. I believe he's the holy man of God. I believe he's, been, he's preaching the very truth of the word of God. And notice what it says. Behold, now I perceive that this is a holy man of God which passeth by us continually. Now, y'all ever had one of those neighbors or one of those friends and you look out in the yard, and here they come again. Mm. My, my grandmother had a cousin, uh, uh, Doug Bridges. And every time he pulled up, and she would always fix for him, she goes, there's Doug again. <laughs> and uh, I wonder, maybe at the beginning, because it said continually, she's like, man, there goes a lot again. Uh, but she stuck to it. And because she stuck to it, he, she began to learn things about Elisha that other people didn't know. And, and, and so we find that, and finally she comes to this conclusion, hey, he's a man of God, and I understand what his ministry is about. So what does she do? She takes it a little further. Let's make a little chamber or room, I pray thee, on the wall. So best I understand, it's just like a little lean-to. You know, houses here in Stewart County, you still see a few of them like that. They usually started with one room, and there was a build on over here, and a build on over here, and maybe a kitchen in the back, and it just kind of flopped out over time. And she's saying, let's just build him a lean-to and put a few things in it. Let's build it. And you know what? I don't think this is a real addition to her house because uh, she says, you know, just someone lean against the house, give him a little... A little she went further. Now, I don't think that she was like exceptional or going, you know, going, you know, building a brick, a three bedroom brick out on the back of the house. But she was given something. But let me remind you again, she was rich. And she probably could have done more. She probably could have done more. And, and, and so we find then that the Shumanite woman approaches her husband with this idea. Let's make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall, and let us sit there, let us sit for him there, a bed, and a table, and a stool, and a candlestick, and it shall be that when he cometh to us, he shall turn in thither. And it fell on the day that he came thither, that he turned into the little chamber and lay there. And he said to Gehazi, now, uh, my grandmother's cousin didn't have any, she had one child when she died. And so when Doug came, Doug was by himself because his wife was, died, was dead and his daughter was dead. But what if Doug had drug in somebody every time that he came to? And, uh, you know, instead of one door on the car opening up, there was two every time they drug up. And see, wherever, until the end, wherever you saw Elisha, you saw Gehazi. And, and, and so we find then 
I don't know at the beginning he was there, but now he's dragging in two people. Every time himself and Gehazi, and here they come. They're ready for their meal. They want something to eat. Now they have this little bedroom they hang out in. When they come, and uh, and he said to Gehazi, his servant, verse 12, call this Shumanite. And when he had called her, she stood before him. Now, <laughs> you ever wonder what she thought? Wasn't there? Elisha's wanting you. He's probably still hungry. Maybe, maybe he needs to clean the, maybe his sheets need to be changed. Wonder what he's wanting now. Yeah, yeah, you know, you, you wonder, was that her line of thought? Or did she run in there with a, with a gladness to be able to serve the Lord? Maybe I'm going to get to do something else for him today. Maybe I'm going to get to uh, fix an extra meal. You know, what was her attitude to being called to the master? And if you ever thought about your own attitude when you're called to the master, when he says, Larry, I want you to do this. No, no, I can't. I, I've got four children to provide for. I can't do that. What is your attitude when you're called to the master? Yeah. And I wonder what the Shumanite woman thought about when, when she was bouncing down there. And again, I have to think, since it was a lean-to, she had to go out of her house and around down to the lean-to to see what was going on. And she arrives at the door to the little part of the house And he said to Gehazi, his servant, call, me, call this Shumanite. And, he, and he, when he called her, she stood before him. And he said unto him, Say now unto her, Behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care, that it is, that it, what, it, what is to be done for thee? So he turns it around on her, gives her a great thanks, and listen, all these nice things that you've done for us, now what can I do for you? You know what? The Lord is the very same way. And, and you do it in silence, and you don't go blowing your own trumpet, and all that. And you know what? The Lord's going to do something great and wonderful for you, too. He says, uh, Shumanite woman, what do you want? What, what would you like me to do? What would you, uh, what, what would you have me to do in return of all the kindness that you have shown to me. And uh, he said, Wouldst thou be spoken for to the king, to the captain of the host? And she answered, I dwell among my own people. In other words, he gave her the opportunity to meet the bigwigs. And he said, What then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, they're just kind of talking this over. Verily, she have no child, and her husband is old. So they, they come up with this plan. She needs a baby. She don't want to go meet the big wigs. And she don't want any more money. She's already rich. Maybe she needs a child. Let's, let's get her a child and, and see what she does with that. And he said, call her, and when he had called her, she stood in the door, and he said, about this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace the son. And she said, nay, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. So the greatest blessing that she wanted, had no idea that it would come that way, she's going to have a son. She had faith. And because she had faith, she gave something of herself. Now we know this woman throughout the ceaseless ages. We know that she was given the son. And this is the thing with serving the Lord. He was taking him back, remember? Came in there and sat on her lap and died. <laughs> and where did she carry him? Right there and laid him on Elisha's bed. And... Uh, and the Lord did great things. We know that Elisha, uh, by the mighty God of heaven, brought him to life again. And this, this, <laughs> this thing is still known of her today. God knows. Now, uh, I'll put out one light, little instance, and we'll read a couple of others, and we'll be done. But what had the Shumanite woman learned? 
You remember, I don't know what her name was, Mrs. Shumanite. Shumanite's a country, or Shuman is a country. Shumanite was just like we're American. And I'm not sure what her name was, but I know this is people went along the way and said, Sarah, how are you doing today? Her answer, it's well. It's good. Been going good. All is well. And her boy back at home lay dead. See, she had learned enough about God that she knew it was well. Now, I really believe this. If Elisha had raised him, she'd still say it was well. She finally learned to understand that God's plan was better than any other plan that was out there. And so we find then that uh, this woman had a great deal of faith and knew that God had everything worked out. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9. Uh, again, very familiar verses of Scripture, so we ain't going to read a whole lot, but I do want to get the, the context of the Scripture in there. Matthew, uh, Matthew 9 and verse number 18. Matthew 9 and verse 18. The Bible says this, While he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. Now, that's faith. That, that, that is believing in the master. That, that is having full confidence that death is under his feet, that he needs no help whatsoever. But what did he ask? Come and touch her. Mm -hmm. You know, and no problem with that, but what is that? It's a work, is it not? That's what it is, is it not? If he had to walk over there and come by and touch him, that's two works, the walking and the touching, right? And, and so he still saw somehow that it took a little something, a physical action, to get the job done. And with our blood, that's not the case. Certainly it's not. Uh, verse 19, and Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. Remember that very same group we, were, we read about in our text. And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood, 12 years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. Amen. So who had the greater faith? The dead, the dead girl's father or that very little secretive woman? All she did was that right there. That's, that's Joe's hand on his breeches. Mm -hmm. And she knew, she knew that there would be healing in that. And you know, you remember how embarrassed she was when he said, who touched me? And she, the Bible says that she was kind of crawling away, and finally she said, it's I. See, she would have received the, the same divine healing, and her testimony was this, that she just was crawling away, and not going, look here, look what's been done, look what I did, here's how much faith I've had. No, 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 she was crawling away, didn't want to be under didn't want to be even spoken of. And her faith is still spoken of and preached about to this very day. Let's have some faith. Let, let's have some confidence in, in the God that we serve. And I will notice you can go through and go through the uh, faith, Abraham's faith, and uh, remember the harlot that tied that little red string in her window. She's mentioned in the great hall of faith. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because she believed God. Now, do you remember how the harlot believed? Two men came by and said, listen, this city's going down. Yeah. And she hid them, wouldn't let the people come in her house. And they said, well, huh. For your help, you're going to be spared. But you go in there and you tie a little string in your window. 
And remember, it did end there. She said, listen, she went around and said, listen, she got her family and her kin and maybe her other harlots all together. Everybody she could cram into that little apartment on the wall. And you know what? Nobody died that were under the scarlet thread. And so we find today a lot of the faith in the Bible is recorded about women. Mm -hmm. And you ever wondered about that? Why is not more said about men? And you know what? I think we have less faith. I, I think we're pretty strong. We're the stronger of the species, right? Um, do a lot of us do back breaking work? All of us, if you if you got your salt, you still work. Do what you can. And we're to take care of women, right? And I'm to go and bring food and and needs home to my wife and my daughters to help get the job to, to get the job done. But if something happened to me, it's gonna begin a lot of faith for Donna, is it not? And so we find I, I find, think that the women, the reason their faith is already strong is they're already dependent on somebody anyway. So who else is to depend on? The Almighty God of Heaven. And, and, and so we find that to be very, very true is that women, many times women's faith is much greater than men's. Now, I want you to go to the Gospel of Matthew, a little, just a little further over, uh, Matthew 14 and verse 25, and I, I, I don't see this one hardly ever read. Matthew 25, excuse me, Matthew 14, verse 25, the Bible says this, Verily, uh, oh, sorry, I'm in Mark. Matthew 25 and Matthew 14, verse 25. Matthew 14 and verse 25. The Bible says, And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus came, uh, well, I'm sorry, let's do verse 36 first. Matthew 14, verse 36. And besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment, and as many as touched were made perfectly whole. Matthew 14, verse 36. And, and besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment, and as many as touched him were made perfectly whole. So how did they get that? How did they begin to understand if I just grab, things are going to be better? You know, I have to come to this conclusion. One of two things, that whole crowd around them that saw that Shumanite woman healed began to say, hey, listen, I saw this thing and this woman had had cancer for years, 12 years, she'd had an issue with her blood and, and she just touched it and everything was okay. Or maybe the little Shumanite woman, very quietly, walking around and uh, they say, you know what, you're looking a lot better. You don't, you don't look so pale as you used to. And then she said, well, let me tell you what happened. And very quietly and very slowly over time, this woman told her story. And my people heard about it, that they began to touch the hem of Jesus' garment. See, the next thing we do, if God does something great, don't go bum, ba, bum, 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 bum. Just go, and if you're in the grocery line, say, listen, I'm, I'm going to tell you what God's done for me today. If, if someone says to you, you know what? <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know how you're still around. Just say, God's been good to me. And, and, and so we find then that this woman, however it became known, I'm not, I'm not real sure that the fact of touching the robe of Jesus was very well known now. Now I'll go back with Matthew 14, just a little bit up. Matthew 14 and verse 25, and in the fourth watch of uh, in the fourth watch of the night, this was their trip over uh, Gennesaret. 
Jesus went into them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit! And they cried out with fear. And straightway Jesus said, uh, spake unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it, if, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come out, was coming, was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and called him and said unto him, O thou of little faith. Now, a couple of things here, a lot of times we want to get down on Peter. But first of all, best I understand, no one in this building has ever been on a ship when there were storms on the sea. So first of all, you can't compare yourself to Peter. You see what I'm saying? You ain't been there, you ain't done that. Secondly, I want you to see they had the, the Gospels live this very same account that they rolled all night and they were keeping trying. And I'm not sure about that. So Jesus came walking on the sea. And Peter, uh, Jesus said, come. And what happened? Peter got out of the ship and down on the water. What about you? That took some faith, did it not? Uh, I love to swim. I used to swim a lot better when I was younger than I can now. Don can't swim. Who do you think is more fearful of water? Yeah. Ever been on a big ship? No. I, I've been on a couple of little river ships, and when me and the girls went down to uh, Alabama, we went out a little ways. But you know, that's nothing compared to not to being in the middle of the night and not being able to see nothing. And just boom, boom. And, you know, when they looked out there, it, it was so windy and so much water flying around, they didn't even recognize Jesus. But they heard his voice. He said, come. And Peter did it for a little while. You know, that's most of us, isn't it? We do it for a little while. You think down through the years, and as we're looking at our 20th anniversary coming up to people, you know what? A lot of people come and go in the New Testament Baptist Church, haven't they? Ever wonder why they're not here? I say it's faith, wouldn't it? Why do people quit church? Well, the devil gets in that thing and, and makes it easier not to go. Maybe. They're pretty flimsy if that was the reason. Something big comes up and tries their faith and they say, hey, I'm done. Right? And so we see then, as the Lord's people, what we need to do is, is grow our faith. You know, I, I made a point that the Shumanite woman, she didn't just add on that addition like that. She, it took her some time. She had to get to know this fella. And over, over a period of time, her faith grew to the point at the end, she, her boy just died in her lap, and she was going around saying, it's all good. Everything's going great. I enjoy doing what I'm doing. To that point, she had grown her faith. What about you? Uh, I believe the Lord's churches are as weak as they've ever been on their faith. You, uh, you know, me and Don was talking about this, maybe me and Brother Junior too, how years ago people would stand and confess their sins to the Lord's people, you know. Yeah. The, we're called to do that. Confess ye your faults one to another and pray ye one for another. And why is that different now? I used to think it's because people were embarrassed. But I've come to this, I think it's because they have no faith. Right. They, they, they have no faith. They have no understanding of who God is. And so, so I listen. Uh, I was listening to some music I hadn't often been listening to last night. Y'all prayed for me. 
you have a self-righteous pride. The very first thing we read that the Pharisees had a different kind of service. The service that's not pleasing to the Lord. 